More brands and businesses are becoming vocal in the movement for racial justice and equity. Some are taking it a step further, pledging donations and changes in their own practices to address workforce inequity. Adidas, which also owns Reebok, is pledging to increase the number of black and Latino employees it hires by the end of next year. Bank of America is pledging to address racial and economic inequalities by partnering with community colleges and universities. Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella has now outlined some plans to double the number of black managers and senior leaders in the U.S. of that company over the next five years. In 2020, after the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis led to protests across America, many U.S. corporations pledged to address racial imbalances in their workplaces. They promised to hire and to promote more Black people and others from underrepresented groups. Now, three years later, we're able to see some of the early results. Bloomberg's Jeff Green and Rebecca Greenfield are here to talk about a new analysis by a big team here in our newsroom. It shows for the first time how some of the most prominent U.S. companies did in making good on those promises, where they've made gains. Across 88 companies, 94% of those net new people were people of color. It's the kind of number when you see it, you go back and you check all your data because you figure you must have done something wrong. And we've done that again and again, and it's correct. And where they still fall short. More than a quarter of companies in our data set had fewer Black executives in 2021 than 2020s. And the question we're talking about right now is, did it continue? I'm Wes Kosova. Today on The Big Take, workplace inequality by the numbers. Jeff, you've been following these numbers for three years now. What got you started on this project? We're trying to find a way to measure diversity. And as Becca knows, it's really frustrating the lack of data that's available that you can compare apples to apples. It just doesn't exist except in this one database, which happens to be secret and protected by the Supreme Court. So you can't force companies to show it to you. And what is this database? Every year, the U.S. Equal Employment and Opportunity Commission requires companies with more than 100 workers to report the race and gender for nine positions, executive down to like service worker. So basically every role by every way you could think of slicing and dicing it in the company. That information is totally private unless a company volunteers to disclose it. What does the government do with this information? They aggregate it. They make a huge database of the whole country so you can track what's happening by like city and region anonymously. And they also can specifically use it to find really bad violators of of, like if if your numbers are really wacky, they're going to come and they're going to ask questions. So when you went off trying to figure out, well, how diverse is the American workforce at these big companies? What did you have to do? Well, we were aware of the data because Facebook and Google, the tech companies were under scrutiny. Black professionals make up just 5% of the tech workforce and 3% of executive positions. From 2014 to 2020, black representation increased by only one percentage point. And the banks were under pressure from the New York City Comptroller to show they were hiring more fairly, especially for women. And so they were convinced to release this data to get these people off their back. So we knew they existed. When we started this project, there were about a dozen companies that had in some way released this data to the public. So we knew it was possible. And Jeff, what made you want to try to get this information for as many companies as you could? It was really the frustration of trying to figure out what was really happening because every company would report this data in a different way based on what made them look good or how they felt comfortable. Some would give just people of color. Some would break it out by different races. Some would put all underrepresented groups together. And it made it next to impossible to put two companies next to each other and see how they're doing. So this was the only way I could think of. You know, apples to apples comparison. And there's a you know a federal law that requires you to do this, and it says exactly how to do it, and each company has to do it the same way. So it is the only set of data that I'm aware of at a federal level that we could go to. So I just I just kept making that case, and the companies just kept telling me I was nuts and it's unreasonable. Reporters like Jeff and I had been aware of this data for a little while because companies were under pressure to do better, specifically with gender, specifically tech companies and banks. But then there was a turning point, which was 
the summer of 2020 when George Floyd was murdered and there were huge protests and a lot of big companies basically said, we are going to do better and we're going to hire and promote more Black people specifically, but then broadly more people of color. In general, we know that most workplaces are lopsided, that at the top are mostly white men and disproportionately so. Like, of course, you know, white people are a larger share of the population, but they still hold even more power and have more money than other groups within the country. So that was when we decided to say, okay, we want to look at this. And that's when we systematically decided to ask the S&P 100, will you give us these EEO one forms? I would say that the murder of George Floyd definitely broke this open as like a plausible request. Companies were not so much suddenly happy to comply, but they were reluctant to be on a list of companies that didn't comply. Being singled out as not cooperating in racial equity was a bad look. So you went to all these companies, you asked for the data, you went back and forth, and then you got the numbers. Which companies gave you data of the S&P 100, the 100 largest companies? The first time we did it, it was 25. The next time we did it, it was 37. The time after that, it was somewhere in the 70s. And now it's 96. Every time we went, there were more companies who were willing to comply. And we weren't the only ones asking, but it became a very common question. If you're serious, where's your EEO one? And at first, companies were trying to give us numbers in different forms, you know, to make themselves look a little better. Or, you know, they thought it was unfair because the form is very specific and doesn't work perfectly for every company. Not every company has crafts workers, for example. But over time, you know, we held firm and said, no, we need the EEO one form. That's the only way to compare companies to each other. And now it, it's much quicker to get that form. They're pretty familiar with that's what we want. That's what matters. Just give it to us. And so what years do these data cover? It's 2020 to 2021. Unfortunately, because of COVID, everything was slowed down. They haven't even submitted their 2022 data. So we don't know what that looks like. They don't have to have that turned in until December. So this is the most current data available for these large companies. And so essentially, you have the numbers for right after a lot of these companies made this big pledge, right at the time when there was the most scrutiny on them. And why don't we start talking about the numbers themselves? What did you find in all of this trove of data? Jeff and some other really amazing reporters at Bloomberg decided to look at where did things change on the margins? Because that's really where you're going to see changes. Basically, all companies can really do is hire people, promote people, people retire, and people are laid off. So they looked at these net worker changes. So that's gains and losses. Across 88 companies, 94 percent of those net new people were people of color, which is really astounding. Like, that is a big change. So, Jeff, let's break that down a little bit. When you say 94% of net new employees, what does that mean? So there's about 9 million employees working at these companies. They added about 300,000 new workers um, over the time period we studied. And of those, only about 20,000 were white. It's the kind of number when you see it, you go back and you check all your data because you figure you must have done something wrong. And we've done that again and again, and it's correct. And I also want to say that we break it out by different racial and ethnic groups, Asian, Hispanic, and Black. You know, they grew more than their share of the population. So it's a disproportionate gain is what we call that. And so that top line number, obviously, is something that these companies would want to boast about. But then you dug more deeply into the data and started to divide it up. And there the picture becomes a little bit more complicated. Can you describe what that looks like, Jeff? What we found was that in the power positions, like executives and managers and professionals, there were fewer gains for the underrepresented workers than in the broader, sort of less skilled, lower paying jobs. But still across the board, they did better. It's just, as you would expect, it seems to be harder for the companies to put people of color into the power jobs than it is for them to get them in the door. But at least across the board, they seem to show gains. Also, when you dig into specific companies, of course, not every company 
did everything across the board. But there were some really big companies that did do interesting and notable things. So one company that we single out is Amazon, which is a big company with a lot of employees. It made a lot of hires in 2021. Of course, a lot of the gains among Black and Hispanic workers specifically were at the lowest level. So, you know, that's warehouse jobs. But when you dig deeper, they also hired a lot of people at the higher levels, too. Another company that stood out to us was Nike, and Nike's a much smaller company, but tends to have pretty high-paying and well-paying jobs, and pretty much for every single racial and ethnic group, especially at the high-paying level. So that's executive, manager, professional, every race and ethnicity saw some gains. So those are interesting trends. Jeff, you also talked about some other companies. What are some of the ones where it stood out to you in the numbers? CVS was interesting. They brought in a lot more people for the, some of the similar reasons. I mean, this is COVID. So you're seeing a lot of a COVID effect here. But the, even interesting, Home Depot and Lowe's shrank during this time period, but their diversity improved. This is a big question that we have is what happens when you lay people off? Does diversity suffer? And companies like that prove the point. We could see it in, right there in the data. They cut workers, but somehow they managed to maintain their diversity and improve it slightly, which is a really relevant question right now. And does that suggest that even though they knew they needed to cut, they were very specifically trying to maintain diversity, even though they had to shrink their overall numbers? That is the premise. We've talked to some people not in the S&P 100 about how they shrink. And everyone that we talked to said, we've already recognized that last in, first out, the idea that you fire the newest workers in a downturn is the way to go. It just doesn't work. That gets rid of all your diversity because your newest workers tend to be your most diverse. It does appear that that's what was happening. I mean, the problem is we don't know because no one will talk to us about what their numbers actually say. After the break, why some companies are hesitant to point out the progress they've made. Becca, we've been talking about some of the success stories, but you also found that some companies moved in the other direction. Yeah, so, I mean, progress is uneven when you dig into specific companies. Not everyone is going to look the same. More than a quarter of companies in our data set had fewer Black executives in 2021 than 2020. So that's the opposite of what you want to see. And there were just a smattering of companies that moved in the opposite direction. So they lost the share of people from underrepresented groups. Yeah. And the key thing here is even where we saw a share decline, we're talking points of percentage points. We really didn't see anybody who went like in a serious opposite direction. What this mostly does is show like areas where companies are deficient, like not having any black executives. Directionally, the, the momentum was clearly in the favor of people of color in this year. And Becca, what are the companies that didn't increase the number of underrepresented employees say about that? I'll say generally companies that had what you might consider good or bad or, you know, whatever their EO one form looked like, didn't really want to talk specifics with us. They didn't want to get into how they did it. A lot of companies sent, we are committed to diversity language, or they would, you know, send like, here, you know, here's what we've said in the past about it. But really no one was going to dig in deep with us on what they did, which really surprised us, actually. You'd think that, you know, especially the ones who made big gains would want to get into it and say, here's how we did it. But they didn't want to. One reason we think that is, is because it very quickly has become very unpopular to talk about diversity in the current cultural conversation. So corporate diversity, equity and inclusion programs are coming under fire now as conservative groups are pushing against the workplace policies. Legal threats against companies promoting these initiatives have only ramped up since the Supreme Court ruling that determined affirmative action was unconstitutional. Things have really changed since 2020. You know, there was, at that time, a big push. People thought it was important. Now, it's not that way. There's a big anti-ESG pushback. So ESG is, you know, companies deciding that they care about social and environmental issues in the way they run their companies. A lot of people are saying that's not important. Corporate anti-woke backlash. Basically, a lot of people saying... Why are we focusing on these things? Companies should only be 
thinking about their bottom line. The U.S. Supreme Court reversed affirmative action in education, which some people think could be applied to companies. They're very worried about legal risk for that. So they have more reasons not to talk about it now than they do to talk about it. I think if this data came out in 2021, there'd be dancing in the streets and companies would be lining up to talk to us. But in 2023, it could be a lawsuit. So they're being more cautious. They're being advised by their lawyers to just be careful what you say and how you portray it. And and that really is kind of unfortunate considering this is pretty much shows what they can do when they're pressed. And what is it that they're afraid of being sued for? I mean, the fact that a disproportionate number of the people they hired were people of color, the groups that are suing over this would say, hey, this shows very clear bias in your hiring, and therefore we should be able to sue you on behalf of white workers who didn't get their share of the jobs that were available. I also think we need to clarify that when there are the the worker losses were, yes, disproportionately white people, but we don't know what that is. That can be Yes, layoffs. It can be firings. It can be retirements. The demographics of the U.S. are shifting that many more people coming into the workforce aren't white. So this is going to happen naturally, but it's not necessarily discriminatory. There are lots of reasons why the losses might look one way or another. Or, you know, a company closing down a warehouse in a disproportionately white part of the country for whatever, you know, maybe the population is shrinking and they don't want a warehouse there and opening it up in a more diverse part of the country. So there's a lot of reasons these changes are happening. I, I think we do need to make that clear. It's, it's not necessarily straight up discrimination. That's a really important point because the workforce at the moment is kind of uh, split where white workers are older and retiring and the black and Hispanic workers are the youngest workers and entering the workforce. So if you want to leave the workforce and you're white, you can probably afford it. But for people of color, they're just getting started and thus less able to leave the workforce when there were buyouts and such as well. There are a lot of dynamics in play that could explain this. It's just we wish the companies would give us some sense of what they think is causing it. Becca, one of the things you write is that for a lot of years, companies said they have a hard time finding qualified minority applicants because there isn't a pipeline. And yet this shows suddenly that pipeline appears when they have to do it. Yeah, I mean, pipeline is something that people like me and Jeff who've been in this world for a long time was a big buzzword. And what exactly is a pipeline? Because you hear that all the time. But what do they mean by that? Well, we don't have enough people with X degree that will lead them to this high paying job, whether that's, you know, a tech job or management position or a CEO position. We just don't have the people with the skills and the talent we need to fill the job. So it's not our fault, actually. It's the structural problem, which we, you know, can do things to change, but it's so long term, you'll never see it. And I think a lot of people have said that's not true. One, there's more creative ways to hire and train people. There's been a push away from requiring college degrees for every single job that might not need them. But also there are reasons that people along the way of their career leave. And I reported on gender in the workplace for a very long time, and that was a big one for women specifically. There were a lot of them in entry-level jobs. Why are they not climbing up this ladder to mix our metaphors? You know, they are discriminated against. The workplace isn't very open and welcoming to them. They have children and find it very difficult to stay in. So there, you know, that's just the gender component. But there are similar reasons for people who are underrepresented. They don't feel welcome. It's very difficult. Or, you know, there are certain in-group skills that lead to your success. So I think it's a much more complicated picture. And it shows when you kind of get rid of some of these excuses, you can not only build out your pipeline, as Jeff said, but get it to the higher paying levels do have more people in these jobs. Also, in this time frame, suddenly work from home was possible. And if you can hire people wherever they are, you can hire from a much more diverse, you know, pipeline of people than you can hire when they have to live in the city where you're based. A company in the middle of America might not have a diverse workforce, but if they can suddenly hire from Georgia and Texas, it works great. When we come back, will companies keep up their diversity efforts? Jeff, as you said, these numbers stop at 2021, and a lot has happened since then. I guess one of the big question marks is, has this flurry of new hiring continued? 
or was it a one-time thing and it's tapered off and people are just going back to their old habits? We don't know for sure, but there are reasons to be optimistic that maybe some of this will continue because people are talking less publicly about diversity topics, but when we dig down, it does appear they're still sending that message to potential employees because companies are kind of stuck. They know it's dangerous to sort of raise their hand and call attention to themselves. But at the same time, what Becca said, the demographics of the country are shifting and you got to hire from the people who exist. You can't be thinking about the workers of the past. So to some degree, this is built in as a requirement for these companies to be competitive. It's very hard to tell what has happened since then. I think, you know, 2021, big year of hiring, economy, very different. Now, a lot of the companies in our set have done layoffs, and we would love to know what those look like. There have been big cultural shifts. We don't know if those have, you know, seeped down internally into hiring managers and companies. I think, like Jeff said in our reporting, like companies and the people hiring and the people who work at them do think it's important. They think it's good for business to have different kinds of people, reach different customers, not make missteps where you might get called out in the broader world. We don't know if that cultural backlash has resulted in different hiring changes, but it it certainly could have. The trend is going to just demographically happen in some way, shape, or form. We know that. But what's interesting to us is if the push will continue. Jeff, you've been working on this data for a number of years. You're waiting for new data to come. Where does the story go from here? What's your next step? Well, I mean, the question we're talking about right now is, did it continue? Uh, we'll, we'll get a really good sense of it sometime maybe mid next year. Like, how big of a deal was it when, when people started to cut back? Did they maintain these gains? An important thing to keep in mind is these are big shares of net workers, but they are very small incremental changes to these 9 million people. I mean, we're talking two percentage points. We're not talking, you know, 50 percentage points. So there's something for everyone here. If you gained only two percentage points across all these people, that's like not very much happened. But if 94 percent of the people you did hire are people of color, that's awesome. It's a very nuanced picture. The big picture is that these companies still look lopsided. It's very hard to make these changes. And like Jeff said, in in the overall picture, it was about a two percentage point shift, which sounds small, but then a lot's happening at the margins. Okay, so at the lower level jobs, there's already a majority of people of color at these companies. So the base is there, that pipeline we're talking about exists inside these companies already. It's just now, like Amazon did, can you move them up? So I guess that's the big question to look for in the future is, did all these people who they hired then start to occupy the middle ranks and ultimately the upper ranks of a company, which is traditionally how people rise? Exactly. It is like really important to keep the focus on the fact that this is like this really great comprehensive set of data that was not available three years ago. And thanks to all the pressure that were put on these companies, even if it's abating, the precedent is there and it's going to be difficult potentially for them to stop releasing this data. So we're going to have like this ability to watch this now that we've never had in the history of corporate America to see like how is this going forward and and what is this going to look like? And I mean, if anything, that's like the big win here. I mean, even if this is just a snapshot, we now have an ability to kind of watch this that we didn't have three years ago. You mentioned that these companies are feeling political pressure. Have you had any indication that some of them are going to stop giving you this data? Not so far. That's what we're waiting to see in terms of 2022. Some of these reports not show up. The trend has been in the other direction, obviously. So now we'll wait and see. That is like one of the big questions yet to be answered is, will there be 88? Will there be 96? Will there be 75? We will find out, you know, next year sometime. Becca, we've been talking about employees, but what about corporate boards? There's been a lot of effort in recent years to try to increase diversity on boards. Broadly, boards are much easier to make more diverse than an entire huge workforce. First of all, you can just add people to boards, which is what a lot of companies have done. And they've made huge gains in gender and race and ethnicity. The same exact trend was definitely seen in the boardroom. Black directors in many companies didn't even have a single black director their last year were about 11 percent from which is almost double with where they started, which means black directors on boards in the S&P 500 are now almost at parity with the population, which is astounding. In two years, they doubled. 
This is a proxy for how much pressure these companies felt. And in the most visible place where you can see them, the boardroom, they really responded. So that's an indication that what we were seeing was specifically in reaction to the environment that they lived in at that time. Jeff, Becca, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks, Wes. It's been really great to get to talk about this. Thanks for listening to us here at The Big Take. It's a daily podcast from Bloomberg and iHeartRadio. For more shows from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. And we'd love to hear from you. Email us questions or comments to bigtake at bloomberg.net. The supervising producer of The Big Take is Vicki Vergolina. Our senior producer is Catherine Fink. Our producers are Mo Barrow and Michael Falero. Kiel de Garcia is our engineer. Our original music was composed by Leo Sidrin. I'm Wes Kosova. We'll be back tomorrow with another Big Take. <laughs> 